Uh, I intend to shock you, so please be prepared for it if you can't handle it. This is your opportunity to leave. Uh, I was once being introduced by someone who didn't have Hans Hermann's aplomb as an MC, and he couldn't remember whether these are called lecterns, rostrums, or podiums, and he said, would the speaker please come and speak from the rectum? So I will uh, <laughs> maybe uh, try to avoid that. Uh, I'm going to be discussing the current fad, the current obsession with inequality in the world. And some of you are familiar with Thomas Piketty, who's the new sort of rock star of economics, uh, wrote a book that is quite turgid and full of data and difficult to read and long, and yet has been one of the best sellers uh, of all time. And, uh, and everyone, it's one of those books everyone thinks they've read, but in fact few people have. And he says in it, for example, that inequality is one of today's most widely discussed and controversial issues. He gets much more dramatic than that, saying that uh, we might not have the Marxist apocalypse, as he puts it, and in his Marxist tones, his paradigm, his philosophy is infused with Marxism, even though uh, many people, including maybe some in this room, will say that he's not a Marxist. Uh, but he talks about not quite the Marxist apocalypse as a result of supposedly growing inequality, the hourglass effect that Marx predicted of a few people becoming very rich and everyone else becoming very poor, the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer, so-called, for which, by the way, there is no data. When anyone says that cliché, ask them, where's the data? Please show me the source. There isn't one. Uh, but nonetheless, he talks about the violent political conflict that inevitably results from inequality and that great inequality generates. And he talks about how, so his whole language is about class struggle. His whole assumption is that inequality, A, is growing. We'll look at whether it really is. B, that it's a problem. And C, that it's a cause of resentment and violence and hostility. Um, so that's the background on which we approach this. Uh, the deep structures within the capitalist system, as he calls it. Now, anyone who's familiar with Marxist literature uh, will know what he really means. And the arbitrary and unsustainable inequality that capitalism generates. And he talks about democracy asserting itself over capitalism, as if these are two juxtaposed ideas in conflict, and you might not yourself be a Democrat, but nonetheless, that's the paradigm and the philosophy he presents. So we need to look at these and what they mean, and uh, I have already in this conference engaged with many fr new friends and acquaintances uh, who seem to buy into, interestingly, even here, in this small group of sort of this private little island of sanity that we were told about into the assumption that inequality is growing, that it's a big problem, that, it's, that the poor are getting poorer and things are getting worse uh, from the perspective of essentially a Marxist paradigm or world view. So before proceeding, let me give you something personal about me. I know that speakers aren't meant to do that, but I think you'll see why it's relevant to what follows. My own background is that I was a Marxist, I was a communist, I was an anti-apartheid revolutionary or activist in South Africa, and I come from that school of thought. Uh, I have now moved, uh, many people say, a, a big distance across to being a radical uh, libertarian anarchist, and when people say that was a big shift in your philosophy, I say, not at all, as a Marxist, I wanted the withering away of the state. I still want the withering away of the state. I just don't want to kill lots of people in the process. <laughs> um, so, so it's actually a surprisingly small step. <laughs> the relevance of this is that I truly do care about the poor and care about poverty. That is my work. My daily work involves me working with peasant farmers, with street vendors, with informal traders. I bring cases to protect them against police raids and, and so on. I, I work with and care about the poor. So that might, made, might, me, might make me a minority of one in this room. So you would think that I would welcome other people who seem to care about the poor and who are obsessed with and worried about inequality and the problem of poverty, as they call it. And, uh, but let me just go into the real thesis of the, so the second part of the title of my talk, 
the socialistic mentality that informs this, or the communistic or socialistic, the person who would have spoken but couldn't make it because he was ill, uh, um, Yuri Maltsev, uh, also always makes the point there is no real difference between socialism and communism, and he's a fabulous speaker, so I am humbled by standing in his, in his shoes. Uh, le let's make this very clear. They do not care about poverty at all. Zero. And I want to demonstrate the degree to which people do not care about poverty, probably also people in this room. The number of people who care about the poor in the, poor in the world seems to me to be extraordinarily and distressingly few, or maybe people just shouldn't bother to care about the poor. I don't know. But certainly the Pikettis and the socialists and the and the inequality junkies do not care about the poor, and the evidence is the following. Few people understand that the greatest accomplishment of humanity is happening right now, and it is virtually never mentioned, and probably none of you have read a word about it. The greatest accomplishment of humanity over the last 20, 25, 30 years has been the virtual elimination of poverty from planet Earth. Now, that might shock and surprise you. How can anyone say that? Well, poverty was conveniently defined for us for the first time in absolute nominal terms in the 1980s in the war on poverty, Jimmy Carter era, as people earning less than $1 a day. By that definition, inflation adjusted for the present, I will compare them, about a third of humanity, 30% or so, were earning less than a dollar a day. In other words, were defined as poor. The war on poverty was meant to alleviate that with foreign aid and uh, various welfare programs. The places in which poverty in fact became alleviated were the places that had freer market economies or that adopted them. In other words, where there was less being done for the poor, as Hayek said, uh, that what governments can do, governments can do more for the people by doing less for the people. Where governments did less for the people, they did better. And in the bigger countries of the world, Indonesia, Malaysia, India, China, when governments started doing less for the people, poverty was alleviated on a spectacular scale, mind-boggling scale. So that when you inflation adjust to about $1.40 a day, which it would be now, the percentage of people who now are poor as objectively defined, I wonder how many of you, just all of you make a guess in your own mind, it's fallen from a third to what? You don't need to tell me, just think about the number. The answer is 3%. Tenfold, or to a tenth, to a decile to be precise. I know there's statisticians here who would not, you can't have tenfold down of something. But anyway, there we are. So, we are talking about a, an astonishing event on planet Earth has happened before us. Some of us in this room are old enough, too many I'm sad to say, uh, to remember when it was common and daily in the media to see pictures and videos of emaciated, starving people in Sudan and Ethiopia and Biafra and elsewhere. That pretty much no longer exists on planet Earth. And not only do we now have only a third of the people, 3% uh, earning less than a dollar a day, but that dollar buys you more. Now, you know, nowadays being poor means you don't have the latest iPad. And people have now motorized transport, they have cell phones, they have housing, they have potable safe water, they, they're no longer suffering from kwashiorkor on significant scales, and so on. So by any objective definition, the data, the facts, not opinions, not what people think, the objective statistics are that poverty as the only time ever properly defined has virtually vanished. Now you would think if people care about the poor, they would be interested in that. They would say, how did this happen? Where did it happen? Why did it happen? What caused it? Not a word in Thomas Piketty's 800 page tome not a word in any of the other literature about inequality. The poor are never mentioned. They, do, they are, have no interest at all in whether the poor have more food, more housing, more transport, better medical care, whether their life expectancy, the fact that it has doubled and in many places trebled, does not interest them at all. Now, this is why I am say we're entitled to say that the socialistic mentality is truly despicable. It is offensive. It is disgusting. 
What they are obsessed with is the rich. They want to destroy the rich. And they do not actually even go into why the rich are rich. Piketty's assumption, for example, is that capital simply builds itself automatically. It has nothing to do with management, nothing to do with entrepreneurship, nothing to do with skill, nothing to do with policies. Capital simply accumulates faster than the GDP. In other words, the rich get richer. This he finds offensive. And so do the others. So when I say Piketty, I'm just referring to the mindset, the, the, the grouping of people who obsess and worry about inequality. So what they do is, they say what we must do is redistribute this capital and destroy this capital, simply reduce the capital. Now, you might find that surprising. They simply do not like there being capital accumulation at all. Regardless of, they never, they never ask, why did it accumulate? They obsess about, for example, the high incomes of chief executives. Never, interestingly, about celebrities. So the Angelina Jolies and the boxing champions and the soccer chiefs and the so on and so forth, uh, no one ever worries about them. In fact, they even go and demonstrate with the one percenters, even though the income of the top celebrity earners is four times that of the top, C, uh, the top 10 percent of CEOs. So they earn more, the Oprah Winfrey's, Tiger Woods and so on of the world. They are never included in the bad people whose wealth must be redistributed, in the evil people. The income difference between the celebrities and the people who work for them on their sets and, st and so on and so forth is bigger, is in fact many times bigger than the income difference between the CEOs of, say, Walmart and the people who do the shelf packing. So there's an interesting thing here. There's an obsessive hatred of people who succeed. Now, why do they succeed is the question. What makes the managers or owners of Walmart prosperous? The answer to that, interestingly, is not themselves, as who I think is the greatest thinker of modern times, Thomas Sowell. He makes the point that you can be the greediest person in the world, the greediest CEO in the world, it doesn't earn you one cent. The only way you get one cent is someone else decides to pay you. Now, who decides to pay you? The answer is the poor. It is the poor who choose to work for them, who choose to buy from them instead of the corner store or someone else or for themselves. They are the people who make the rich rich. So actually what they hate is not so much the rich, they actually hate the poor who vote with their dollars for the rich. That's who they hate. So when I say they not only do they not care about the poor, they do not write a word about the poor. They have no interest in the fact that poverty is being alleviated or where it's alleviated. They have a callousness that is almost incomprehensible. But they even hate what the poor do, which is to support and work for the people they hate, the rich. And uh, so it's actually sort of evil twice over if, if hating the poor is evil. Uh, maybe you do too, but you're not recalling for redistribution. And um, so let's understand also this term redistribution of wealth itself is very loaded, the distribution of wealth. It's as if there's an amount of wealth somewhere and we get Hans Hermann to redistribute it amongst us. How much will you get? How much will you get? Whatever. That is not how wealth works. Wealth is not distributed. Wealth is earned and created. And even words like wealth, for example, they talk endlessly about the Gini coefficient. I did, by the way, have some slides which I'm unable to use, so I'm having to suddenly convert all of this into words, and it's maybe not as graphic as the slides, but let's understand the term Gini coefficient. As the statisticians here know, the Gini coefficient is simply one of the interesting technological measurements that economists and econometricians do. It is the amount of income going to some people as opposed to others, and the distribution across society of income. Now, the Gini coefficient, for example, of one or a hundred is an easier index Gini, easier to use, uh, would be where one person owns everything. And a Gini of zero would be where there is total equality. Now, a Gini of 50, halfway, what does that tell you? That could mean that the top 50% have everything and the bottom 50% have zero. Or it could mean that there's an hourglass effect with no middle class and lots at the bottom, lots at the top. Or it could be that it's an oval effect 
with a big bulge in the middle and two peaks at the top and the bottom. So what it tells you is very limited. It's a very limited interest to statisticians and economists. It's not a great statement about the state of humanity and society. It actually tells you almost nothing about the state of society. And then the other big thing is they talk about the income gap. For example, India and China, which have been growing spectacularly all of a sudden, so uh, two billion human beings rise like the genie from the bottle out of misery and destitution and poverty into having cell phones and safe water and motorized transport and health care and long life expectancies and full tummies. Of no interest, I repeat, to the socialists. They, they do not care a damn about it. And I really mean that. They do not mention it. They're not interested in it. it is never, they, they, they never discuss the state of the poor. They discuss only the state of the rich. Now, when you start off, let's hypothetically, for statistical ease, assume everyone is at 10. And some people get 1,000 units. You now have growing inequality. They call that a problem. I call it a solution. It's a solution to equal dis uh, destitution. And so what happens is as some people rise, others rise too. No one's worse off. In fact, everyone is better off according to the objective statistics, the data. That's not my opinion. Those are the facts. You're entitled to your own opinions, not your own facts. I'm talking about the facts. And the facts are that the lower income groups, the poorest of the poor, the bottom 10% of humanity, have had rapidly rising incomes, not as fast, maybe, as the rich, but in fact often faster, and then the gap still grows. So just do some simple arithmetic. I had a chart I would show you this, but just imagine someone on 10,000, someone on 100, which is about the difference between the richest and the poorest countries, the richest and the richest and poorest people, if you add 10% to the top income earners, how much would the bottom income earners have to earn to not increase the gap? Because a little bit of a lot compared to a lot of a little, the answer is 1,000%. So if you have 10% growth rate for the rich of capital accumulation, you would have to have 1,000% for the poor for the gap to stay the same. Never mind contract. So if you want to reduce inequality, comprehend what they are saying. They are not saying they worry they want the poor to rise. Because rising the poor will not close the gap. Simple arithmetic. They are wanting to destroy the rich. But only some rich. That is the rich who became rich by providing goods and services. And they want to, to the poor who voted for them with their dollars, then they want to take the wealth from the rich and give it to politicians on a global scale. They propose a 1% tax for anyone with wealth. They never, by the way, tell you by whether by wealth they mean capital, which is an investment, or wealth, which means assets. A yacht is wealth, a factory is capital. Income is what you earn you'd be amazed at how sloppy supposedly top respected world economists are at understanding something that elementary and distinguishing between these different concepts of being well off or badly off. So, what, uh, uh, what we understand then is that, well, let me just look at my notes here, where to go from here. Oh, yes, let me just give you some example of this, this concept of, of Gini coefficient. The Gini coefficient, which you will hear a lot about, and please do me a favor and understand what it is. It measures the amount of income people earn. It's not their wealth, it's not their assets, it's the amount of income they earn, and it varies from country to country whether that is before or after tax. There are only about 60 countries for which the statistic out of 210 or so countries is even meaningfully uh, uh, calculated. But the World Bank publishes now data for about 150 countries, most of which are, you know, uh, dubious. But if you take Germany, for example, which has an officially published genie of 42, meaning uh, nearly somewhere below 50, if you include welfare, infrastructure, medical services, pension funds, etc., etc., 
If you include welfare in cash and kind, the figure drops to 20. In other words, zero is equal, 100 is unequal, it drops to 20. In other words, Germany suddenly plummets from seeing like an, seeming like an unequal society to being a highly equal one, if you think equality is important, and I don't. I can see absolutely no reason why it matters. As somebody care about the poor, I'm interested in are the living standards of the poor rising? That interests me. I really don't care about how rich, rich people are. I truly don't. I mean, I'm talking about a personal, emotional, psychological state of affairs. So this obsession with inequality or the, or the hatred of wealth or success or creativity or prosperity or saving or investment, I don't share. I do care about whether the living standards of poor people are rising, and they are, and that should be celebrated. We need a global celebration, like a Rio carnival, uh, to celebrate what has been accomplished. So in the UK, the figure is 45, it drops to about 20 when you start including all the, in, all of, all the welfare and direct and indirect. The US drops from 45 to 50. Talk of the US, by the way. OECD gives the US a Gini coefficient of 37. The US itself says it's 47. That's a big difference. That's 25% difference. So what are they measuring? How do we know the difference? As it would, this OECD doesn't release its methodology as it happens. Sweden drops from 36 to 15 once you start including welfare. So then we even get to the question of the UNICEF carries on about inequality, the United Nations inequality. It obsesses about the fact that children, 50% of children earn less than $2 a day. Well, why do they earn anything? Is that child labor? Now, just note this. The Gini coefficient doesn't measure the well-being of children, for example, who might be extremely wealthy but have no income. You do have Ginis for what it's worth. People do Ginis for assets and capital and other things too, but mostly it's about income. And so, well, of course children earn less. Even when they do start earning something in their teens, they start at the bottom of the income and employment ladder and work their way gradually up and earn more in older age. So, as Thomas Sowell data that he's produced shows that something of the people in that start off in the bottom um, quintile, 20%, that of those, over half end up in the top quintile. So that they're not fixed groups, the rich, the poor. They're mobile groups, people who move from one bracket through to the others and maybe, and typically in life upwards, not always. People like me actually move downwards which improves the data for everyone else. Um, so let's look at then uh, uh, the, the uh, yes, the other thing is they speak for the poor. And I, I just want to make this point, that they carry on about how inequality is destabilizing, conflict-provoking, causes uh, hostility in society, and even violence. And people like Piketty says, unless we reduce it, there's actually going to be a Marxist-type violent revolution of the poor rising up against the rich. Is that true? Can they actually speak for the poor? Now, I happen to, I think, maybe rub shoulders with the poor more than most people who are not themselves poor. I find none of this on a daily basis. I do not see them resenting and hating the rich. On the contrary, I see them flocking into their shops, going to them for jobs, smiling and being happy, and so on. And then what do I see? Television, soap opera. What is soap opera? This means this is, this is the poor looking at and enjoying the rich. Other people's wealth is what's called in economics a positive externality, not a negative externality. It's not a source of resentment. It's a source of admiration and pride. And people would prefer to work for a rich person than for a poor person. They feel better about it. The person who's the stagehand doing the woodwork or whatever on the Oprah Winfrey set is pleased to be working for one of the world's wealthiest people, whereas someone else who's in the local backyard uh, theater group, doesn't, earning the same, does not feel as good about themselves. 
So this idea that the poor resent the rich is not justified. And Thomas Sowell uh, studies this in his book, which, uh, which one of the delegates have very kindly lent me to get the quote from. And he looks at it in various countries and reaches the following conclusion. He says, this idea, the unsubstantiated assumption that disparities in income and wealth promote intergroup strife and reductions thereof, reduce resentments, hostility, and violence. In the country studied, all the evidence points in the opposite direction. There was far less intergroup violence when disparities were greater and far more after disparities in political and politicization had reduced them. So in other words, the, the, the facts are, the data so, the actual is that the hostilities, intergroup hostilities, are not the Marxist idea of the working class hating and resenting the capitalist class. This is not, this is a myth, this is an idea, this is an axiom, a meme that has been put about for which there is no empirical support. And we can see it around us. The poor do, do, do not go around, the waiters here serve richer people all the time, every day. They seem, outwardly, unless they're very good actors, to not be concealing some deep and bitter hatred and resentment towards us. Well, I haven't sensed it. If you have, then I think it's because you're a deep and bitter and hateful person. <laughs> um, so, and then what does Piketty say? What do these intellectuals say? Now, just to get you back to the Marxist paradigm and mindset of the socialists, and as Yuri Maltsev, who I uh, replace, because he's not well, and I wish him a fast recovery, uh, uh, would, would point out, if you look at, look at the language, and they talk about themselves being the intellectuals. Now, those of us who studied or were Marxists know all about the role of the intellectuals. There's working class logic, and there's capitalist cloud, bourgeois logic, and then there's the intellectuals. We're a sort of special group. We're exempt from class consciousness and all of that. And the role of these Piketty-type intellectuals is to lead and inform the people, to unmask preconceived and fraudulent notions of the kind you've been hearing about from me. Uh, this is the role that the intellectuals should play with more time than others to devote themselves to study and to be paid for it. So this is how they see themselves. So someone must pay them, not the capitalists, to study the, uh, the evils of inequality and to make the poor conscious of it and angry about it and rise up against it. Because they don't do it by themselves. Without the intellectuals stirring them on, they go about life perfectly happily, uh, buying their new cell phone and their iPad and, and smiling at, at the customers at this wonderful hotel. And uh, so, and he, as he puts it, the intellectuals will never put an end to the violent political conflict that inequality inevitably instigates. So having said that the role of the intellectuals is to instigate it and to bring about the conscientization of the poor who are victims and dupes of capitalism, that, that it is inevitable, which was of course the old contradiction in Marxism, is that it's meant to be inevitable yet the intellectuals have to bring it about. Uh, so which is it? So with that let me say that uh, the, the, the evidence is extraordinary. Uh, that the rise from destitution of most of humanity has been spectacular. And it is absolutely fascinating to me that it is not widely known, even in this room. I wonder how many people here knew that, and I wouldn't be surprised if you're sitting there saying you don't believe me. Look it up. Look up the data. It's readily available. It's the one thing. You can do it on your cell phone over coffee. It's readily available, readily available data that... Poverty has essentially, for practical purposes, for almost all of humanity, by the only objective definition ever given it, been eliminated. The new definition is now $2 a day. They've increased it by 100, well, by a third, because adjusted for inflation. It's now $2. 
that pushes the number up to 10. I'm sure they're going to increase that to 4 or 5 so we can be back at about a third of humanity supposedly being poor. That means a third of humanity not having the latest iPad or iPhone. Uh, iPhone 6 just came out the other day, so they'll all be buying it. So what we have is that inequality grows because there is growth. It is a necessary consequence of increased prosperity because a little bit added on to the rich is more than a lot added on to the poor. The poverty has been eliminated and these people who obsess about inequality are loathsome, nasty human beings and they're not nasty because they hate the rich. I do too. They don't give me nearly enough money for my work. <laughs> they are nasty because they hate the poor. They either simply don't care about the poor at all. They have no interest in where the poor's standards of living have risen. Not one word is written in any of their literature that I could find. Certainly not one word in Piketty. And they actually hate the fact that the poor support and like the rich. They admire them. They don't aspire to being like them. That's a myth too. They're perfectly happy doing what they do. Uh, but they enjoy other people's wealth as a positive externality. It is very clear from magazines, from newspapers, from television, from life in general, from the worshipping and adoring of successful people. And so here we have that this, this whole inequality story is really, I think, it is one of the biggest issues now. It's probably the biggest ideological issue confronting people in this room. Now, this is what it is, the war on inequality. It is riddled with flaws, factually incorrect, and I think morally loathsome. Thank you.